Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Freeland. Uh, as we gather here today, I want to give uh, people just a, a few more seconds to come into the session, um, and we'll get started just a, a minute after the top of the hour. All right. Hi, everyone. Again, I'm Chris Freeland. I'm a director of the Open Libraries program at the Internet Archive, and I want to welcome everyone to Burning the Books, a discussion with librarian and author Richard Ovenden in conversation with writer and historian Abby Smith Rumsey. As I mentioned, I'm Chris Freeland. I'm a librarian at the Internet Archive. We have a really uh, fantastic crowd joining in today, and some of you might not be very familiar with the Internet Archive, so I'd like to tell you just a, briefly a little bit about our library. We provide world access to billions of archived web pages, millions of hours of video, and more than 4 million digitized books. So libraries fill an important role in society. I can say that as a, as a librarian. You know, we provide access to information, and we uh, preserve that information over time. But throughout history, that role has been challenged by the deliberate destruction of knowledge. So in our conversation today, Abby Smith Rumsey will talk with Richard Ovenden, the Bodley's librarian and the author of Burning the Books about these attacks on knowledge. But first, I have to ask, have you gotten your copy of Burning the Books yet? Um, I'd like to encourage you, if not, to um, visit our local bookstore in San Francisco, which you can do online, The Booksmith, and purchase a copy. And if you're not able to purchase it um, through The Booksmith, then please do uh, support your local library and, and pick up a copy. It's great to support local, uh, local bookstores. So um, some logistics before we dive in. This session is being recorded, and so all registrants will receive an email after the session with a link to the recording. The session is also being live streamed on YouTube, so hello viewers on YouTube. Um, closed captioning is available for the session. If you click on live transcript, then you can show the subtitles or the full transcript. Also, uh, we'd like this to be a bit of an interactive session, so please use the chat to ask questions. And we'll be gathering questions for Abby to work into our conversation um, as we round uh, towards the end of the conversation. So please do use the chat and also please do be respectful in our conversation today. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to the founder and the digital librarian of the Internet Archive, Brewster Kale. Are you there, Brewster? Yes, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and this is just a fantastic opportunity, I think, for me particularly, um, but I think for all of us to hear these great scholars in conversation. Uh, it's actually a dream of, of mine, uh, after having read Richard's book, uh, to um, well, go further um, with, with, with Richard and also hear him in conversation with Abby Smith Rumsey. So a little bit of just who are uh, uh, um, Richard and, and, and Abby. Um, Richard is the um, 25th um, of Bodleian's librarians, um, only 25 over the centuries uh, at the University of Oxford. It is a fantastic uh, collection. I, I met uh, Richard when he would, he had the best title in the world. It was the keeper of the books. Um, and so when I was given a tour years and years ago of um, uh, of the bodily, and he he uh, he brought me around, and it was just fantastic. And he said, you, you, "Brewster, you're 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 in luck. Um, uh, we're bringing down one of our treasures for a scholar." And it was a uh, I believe it was a ninth century uh, edition of Euclid's Elements. Uh, Euclid, Euclid's Elements is the old oldest extant copy of, of Euclid's Elements, um, which is geometry that we all learned in, in, uh, in, in high school. And this is just, you know, it was in the original Greek from Constantin Constantinople. And I, I got to ask the scholars sort of what was interesting about this, because we knew all the words, those have been copied out. Um, and he said, well, it's the object itself. And what happened to the object? I said, so how much did a book cost? 
then he's and he turned to the very end of the book and it wasn't the beginning of the book there was the price in whatever uh units there were, were at the time and uh and he said well this is about three months of a civil servant's salary i thought that was an interesting you know it's not mcdonald's hamburgers or something to go and translate value over time so it, you know so it didn't cost uh, as much as a house but it was more than a hovel right it's sort of uh, that kind of uh uh, what a book costs in that time. And they knew this uh, in, uh, because of the collections um, that, uh, in, at Oxford and, and at the Bodleian. And, and, uh, and Richard has written this fabulous book. I highly recommend uh, uh, this book because what happens to libraries is they're burned uh, and they're burned on purpose. Um, so let's try to learn and understand why that happens and design for it. Um, so that we have a, a continuity uh, of, of knowledge. Abby Smith Rumsey, um, I got to know her when she was at the Library of Congress and is a historian uh, and uh, over the arc of, of history of thought and is a fabulous writer. She wrote a book um, that is really, really good, When We Are No More. And it is grappling with the sort of the, the meth, the evolution of how thought was organized and kept and uh, uh, knowledge was organized, but within sort of how did it get incorporated into people's thinking? And how is that changing now with the digital world where everything either lasts forever, if you don't want it to, or never, it goes away immediately if you really wanted to have kept it. What does this mean for our sense of self uh, and history of thought? And so these are two uh, heavy thinkers that have done serious work on the history that can help inform uh, where we're going for here. So thank you very much for coming. And I'd just like to uh, now toss to, uh, to Abby. Thank you very much, Brewster. And thank you, Chris. And welcome everybody to a conversation I very much look forward to with Richard Avenden, um, who is in England um, in his library at home. Um, so first, I want to say, you know, deep congratulations, Richard, to this book. Um, it's really, um, it's very informative, which, of course, is the highest praise. I learned a great deal, and I think everyone will learn a great deal. But I think, for me, the most striking thing is the way that going all the way back to Mesopotamia, this, the problems we have with the creation, appreciation, and storage of knowledge um, is, can, is exactly the same as it is now. Um, which is both heartening and disheartening. Um, and so I find that, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about your book is the way you, you talk about the history of knowledge, its creation and its destruction, and it's also, also its resurrection, but always in the context toggling between then and now. So I want to have people get a little sense of the taste of the book. And I'm gonna ask you, if you would please, to read an excerpt from the book, and then we can start talking. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Abby, and thank you, Brewster, and thank you to the Internet Archive for suggesting um, this conversation. And it's wonderful to be talking to Abby, who's a very old friend and, um, and uh, a historian and, and writer and uh, who I admire uh, very much indeed. So this is a great, great pleasure indeed for me. And um, I'm gonna start by reading you um, a few paragraphs from the introduction to my book. So I thought this might be the best thing to, to do. And I, I'm going to begin with my kind of day job. So I'm lucky enough to work in one of the world's great libraries. Formerly founded in 1598 and first opened to readers in 1602, the Bodleian in Oxford has enjoyed a continuous existence ever since. Working in an institution like this, I'm constantly aware of the achievements of past librarians. The Bodleian today has well over 13 million printed volumes in its collection, plus miles and miles of manuscripts and archives. It has built up a broad collection, including millions of maps, music scores, photographs, ephemera, and a myriad other things. And this includes, of course, petabytes worth of digital information, uh, electronic journals, data sets, images, texts, emails, and the collections are housed in 40 buildings ranging from the 15th to the 21st century. And they themselves have a fascinating history. 
My own education up to the age of 18 was transformed by being able to use my hometown of Deal. That's a tiny little village on the south coast of England, about five miles away from Dover, just to give you on the English Channel. And I used its public library. And in that building, I discovered the joys of reading, particularly through science fiction, especially Isaac Asimov, Brian Aldiss and Ursula Le Guin. And then I read Thomas Hardy and D.H. Lawrence, but also authors from beyond Britain, Herman Hesse, Gogol, Colette and many more. And I found I could borrow vinyl records and discovered there was more to classical music than Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. There was Beethoven, there was Vaughan Williams, Mozart. And I could read serious newspapers and the Times Literary Supplement, all for free. And this is a crucial thing because my family were not wealthy and there was not a lot of money um, in my household to buy books. That library was, and indeed is still to this day, run by local government, free for users of the majority of its services and funded from local taxation under the legal provisions that were first set up by the Public Libraries Act of 1850. There was political opposition to the idea at the time. As the bill worked its way through Parliament, the Conservative member, Colonel Sibthorpe, was sceptical of the importance of reading to the working classes on the grounds that he himself did not like reading at all and had hated it while at Oxford. The Public Libraries Act made it possible for local authorities to institute public libraries and pay for them through rates, as local taxation was then called. But this system was entirely voluntary. It was not until 1964 that the Public Libraries and Museums Act made it a duty under the law for local authorities pro to provide libraries, and the system retains a strong place in the general public consciousness today as a cherished service, part of the national infrastructure for public education. Libraries and archives share the responsibility of preserving knowledge for society. This book has been written not just to highlight the destruction of those institutions in the past, but also to acknowledge and celebrate the ways librarians and archivists have fought back. It is through their work that knowledge has passed down from one generation to the next, preserved so that people and society can develop and seek inspiration from that knowledge. In a famous letter of 1813, Thomas Jefferson compared the spread of knowledge to the way one candle is lit from another. He who receives an idea from me, wrote Jefferson, receives instruction himself without lessening mine. And he, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. Libraries and archives are institutions that fulfill the promise of Jefferson's taper, an essential point of reference for ideas, facts and truth. The history of how they have faced the challenges of securing the flame of knowledge and making it possible to enlighten others is complex. Individuals, individual stories in this book are instructive of the many ways knowledge has been attacked throughout history. Jefferson's taper remains alight today thanks to the extraordinary efforts of the preservers of knowledge, collectors, scholars, writers, and especially the librarians and archivists who are the other half of this story. Oh, I've, I've lost your sound, Abby. Yes, I was trying to be discreet, sorry. It was a little too discreet. Um, so you, you mentioned in your um, introduction that there are two triggers for writing the book. The first, which you just described, is the one you're concerned about, the, the neglect, basically, the lack of funding and attention paid to public libraries and other libraries in general when access to information is so crucial. The other you mentioned is the destruction of records during a so-called Wind, Windrush scandal. Um, in Britain, and, and we're not familiar with that. I'm wondering if you could just briefly describe what, what happened in that scandal. And then I will ask you about some destruction, inadvertent of the, and otherwise, of records. Okay, so um, the after World War II, citizens from the former British Empire, um, uh, in particular from the British West Indies, were invited to come back to the UK or to come to the UK um, to work. 
and um, you know, as part of the kind of reconstruction of of, of Britain post-war, and the f uh, and in particular because they were part of what was then the Commonwealth, as the Empire turned into this new entity called the Commonwealth. Um, they felt that they were kind of coming back, almost coming back home, you know, that they were coming to an, um, you know, part of their own heritage in a way. And the first of the, um, uh, the, the people to arrive in this way under these terms arrived on a ship, a, 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 you know, a cruise, a, I think it was a, actually a former cruise ship called the Empire Windrush. And so they became known as the Windrush Generation. That was the first ship to dock in uh, Southampton in the, I forget exactly, the late 1940s, early 1950s. And what happened in 2010, as we saw in the early years of the 21st century, that immigration into the UK became an absolutely key um, political point of contention. And um, the the conservative governments of the um, uh, which uh, came with uh, David Cameron and then with uh, Theresa May um, instigated a immigration policy that was called the hostile environment to give you. And that, that really conveys the sense of the um, pressure that was placed on citizens, many of whom have been living in the UK and working, many of them in public service of various kinds, quite happily for 50 years or more in some cases. And that these individuals were then targeted by the hostile environment, uh, under the auspices of the hostile environment, by um, the government department responsible for that policy, which is called the Home Office. And the Home Office then identified individuals and sought to put them under a great deal of pressure to prove their right to settle status in the UK. And of course, many of these people have been here a very long time. They've been in and out of the UK multiple times. They didn't think that they would need to keep those records themselves. That, that why on earth would I be challenged? You know, I've been working in the National Health Service. I've been working in hospitals or in the police force or whatever for decades. And they all kind of took it for granted the hostile environment became a very key political issue. And in 2010, uh, it was cranked up. And then in 2018, just as I was beginning to think about this book, um, uh, a, an investigative journalist discovered that the same government department imposing this policy, putting um, our fellow citizens under great duress, um, deliberately destroyed an archive of documents that, that were the landing cards of these same individuals that proved the terms, you know, the time and the circumstances under which they came to live in the UK. And it struck me that this was a classic example of the social importance of the preservation of knowledge. If those individuals had had access to those records, they could have used it to pro to protect themselves in essence. And I think there's been something like 23 people have taken their own lives. Many, many more have been um, deported erroneously. The poll policy has been reversed. Um, compensation is now being paid to these individuals. And it's just a disgraceful episode in, in, our, in British public life. And um, it prompted me as, as I read this newspaper report of the destruction of the archive, that I wrote a, an op-ed piece in the Financial Times newspaper. And um, the next day, a publisher wrote to me and said, this will make an interesting book. And I said, well, actually, I'm already thinking about it. So there we go. Yeah, well, it's, it's a wonderful and very sad story that you tell and one that's very resonant with us. You know, when I read that story about Windrush, I immediately thought of something that you actually feature later in the book, which is the, the burning, the deliberate burning of the library in Sarajevo, which happened during the Balkan War when, when the Serbs were trying to destroy, um, you know, um, Croatian identity, essentially. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, you have this wonderful um, epigraph in the beginning by Heinrich Heine saying, in which he says that wherever they burn books, they will also in the end burn human beings. And I'm wondering about this long history, or maybe it's a recent history, certainly it's part of modernity, 
that people are um, closely associated with records around them. That in fact, as Windrush shows and, and Sarajevo shows with the deliberate destruction of records of people's past, that to, to destroy the, the history of people and even the documentation of people is to destroy people as human beings. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the consequences or how you really understood the consequences of the Sarajevo incident. And furthermore, why that, why the incident of the burning of the library was so, um, so shattering to those of us in the library world and so essentially unknown and unnoticed by the rest of the world. Yeah. So um, Sarajevo, I, I, I sort of vaguely remembered it from the time, uh, 1992, I'd just begun to work at the National Library of Scotland. And I remember um, being in a national library, hearing about what had happened in Sarajevo. And there was a kind of, uh, there was a kind of fundraiser at the time among the staff to raise money to send to our colleagues. And our conservation department actually you know, reached out to say, is there any, what can we do to help? Is there anything we can do to help? But of course, there wasn't anything that they could do to help because Sarajevo was besieged for six years by Serb militia. And uh, the shocking thing to me as I um, researched this particular episode, and I want to pay tribute to a librarian, Andras Riedelmeier, who's just retired from the Fine Arts Library at Harvard, who did an enormous amount of work at the time, just both to raise awareness of what was happening there, but also then he was employed by UNESCO to write a big report on what happened to the documentary heritage, and he ended up actually giving evidence at the International War Crimes Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague, and actually Actually kind of was face to face with you know Slobodan Milosevic and Ratlan, Ratlan Madic and others um, in, in giving evidence of what had happened to libraries and archives. So the, the National Library of Bosnia and Herzegovina in Sarajevo, which was also the University Library of Sarajevo, um, was deliberately targeted with incendiary shells by the besieging Serb forces. So the building in which it was housed had been the former kind of city hall of Sarajevo and it had been built in the 19th century in an architectural style that mirrored the multicultural um, sort of society that Sarajevo embodied. So there were Muslim architectural elements, there were Jewish uh, uh, decorative motifs and there were Christian um, uh, sim symbolism as well there. And that actually reflected in 1992, the contents of that library. So um, it reflected the history, uh, you know, there were um, you know, a million and a half books, there were uh, many original manuscripts, archives, as well as, you know, the working library of modern publications for the university. And um, not only was it set on fire by those incendiary shells, but the librarians and firefighters who tried to rescue collections from the burning building um, were targeted by snipers. And actually what happened across Yugoslavia or the former Yugoslavia in particular in Bosnia, um, but also in Kosovo was that um, the Serb forces literally wanted to eradicate the memory of that successful cohabitation of different peoples and in particular land registries in provincial archives were targeted so that the records of Muslims owning property in Bosnia would no longer be there would no longer be documentation of that and I think you know this is part of this is what is meant by ethnic cleansing it's not just the you know it's it's mm -hmm. it's the eradication of that memory it's the eradication of that history and that of course presaged a human genocide you know yet last year we marked 20 the 25th anniversary of Srebrenica so this is not this is not a long time ago and I think that was one of the shocking things about it to me as well is that um you know this my brother was in the UN forces in Kosovo I, I mean you know this is very much within living memory and I tried to find at the time a part of the research for my book I went to the you know the front page of the 
you know, one of the British newspapers of record, the Times, and, and it didn't get, even get to the front page of the Times newspaper in London. And I know that the modes of communication were different at the time, but um, you have to go to like page 10 to find the newspaper story about the National Library being destroyed. And, you know, a, 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 a librarian lost her life on that day, Ada Butorovich, let's remember her name. Um, she, was, she was murdered by a sniper fire on that day. And there were many other libraries, a famous library, the Oriental Institute Library in Sarajevo was destroyed with thousands of unique um, Turkish and Persian and Arabic documents um, destroyed. And um, this was mirrored all over. And there are also you know, many stories of individuals in communities with you know, of, of mixed ethnicity, supporting each other as the Serbs came to find the baptismal records that, you know, Muslims were helping Christian pastors hide their baptismal records or the other, the other way around. So, um, that's, um, you know, th that's, that's part of the story that I wanted to tell in that chapter. Yeah, and one of the things that's very chilling that you say is that the whole subject of this crime was not even recognized in the international tribunals. They weren't, you know, the people who were accused of the genocide. This was not part of the um, accusation against them, when clearly the destruction of the people in physically was actually only one part of the destruction of the people as a whole. That is the destroying their memory and, you know, the, and any record that they had existed, let alone health, land or anything like that is the ultimate form of genocide. And in that sense, um, another thing you point out that's so incredibly chilling is that um, this, and this is not a conclusion you draw, but that I drew, um, as I drew many conclusions from your book, that in some ways, this is an even more sinister um, advance on genocide than even the Holocaust. And I'm not trying to compare them, but it is another kind of Holocaust. And in fact, in a very wonderful um, and, um, very memorable chapter you describe about the destruction of the libraries in Vilnius at the time and employing um, the learned Jewish scholars and librarians to select which books would be destroyed, but also which ones would be kept. The Nazis actually developed a library of uh, the culture that they were about to extinguish, um, the, the Jewish culture, which in fact, because they were interested in preserving it in some way for their own reasons, a lot of things survived in a similar way librarians and citizens saved a lot of that learning. But in the case um, in the Balkans, um, they didn't want to preserve anything of the culture. It was a total wipeout. And in some ways that's just even to me more, more chilling. So I wanna, I wanna move um, from the destruction of people's, um, people's identities through the destruction of literature, of their, their record. Um, um, because of some of the most fascinating chapters to me, and I think the most um, surprising, were the stories you told about the history of destruction or near destruction of personal papers by creators and the people who were executors of those creators. So you talk about the, the I think by now rather famous story of Kafka telling his best friend and executor, Max Brogue, to burn everything. Um, Although why he didn't burn it himself is another question. Of course, we always have to wonder. And Max decided that he wasn't going to um, burn his friend's literature. Um, but Byron's um, journal was burned and Larkin's, Philip Larkin's as well. So I'm wondering particularly the connection with the Bodleian and Larkin, if you could give some perspective, some ethical perspective as well as historical perspective on the self-censorship or yeah, the self-censorship of creators and others of the record for any number of reasons, such as trying to protect their own reputation or that of their family and friends. What yeah, do you say I, to that as a librarian? Well, I'm 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 a guinit, uh, Abby. Um, <laughs> um, I'm I'm a sort of you know compulsive preserver, and you know I, my, that's naturally my instinct is to say don't don't do anything like that. But it's it's really interesting. It's complicated. There are um, very um, key ethical points that come up in all of this. I mean, it's quite interesting last week. I don't know if you followed the story in the UK, but Jeanette Winterson, a famous writer, um, uh, burned copies of her own books um, in a very kind of public manner um, on social media 
And because she was unhappy with the publisher's blurb that had been put on new editions of her books, so she actually kind of set fire to them. And this caused a great sort of um, debate among the chattering classes in the UK. Um, and I was called up by the Sunday Times for a quote because obviously I, they assumed that I'd hired her as my publicity agent. Um, but... Um, uh, uh, and what I, th you know, my response to that was that, you know, burning books is is quite a, is a really kind of serious cultural thing to do. And that um, I, I felt that it was possibly over the top to have, do have done this. But actually, I respected her own right to manage her own reputation in that way. And although why I thought it was slightly kind of dramatic to, to take that kind of task, because, you know, the other occasions in history where books have been burned are culturally highly kind of charged and resonant. But when it comes to that sort of the destruction of, a, you know, manuscripts and the kind of particularly journals, very private writing. Um, I think one has to respect the, the wishes of individuals. And um, I think, but, you know, there are these kind of issues over, um, you know, what is in the public interest? What is in the, the you know, and, and I think most of us would recognise that, um, you know, Max Broad did the world a great service by disobeying the instructions of his great friend, Franz Kafka. Um, and, um, but did Philip Larkin, uh, you know, I absolutely respect the, his, that his wishes were carried through by his, um, by his uh, secretary and former lover um, in the destruction of his private journals. Because, um, you know, the, something which is so private like that um, is, is in a kind of a different character, char character, I think, to, let's say, um, Kafka's unpublished drafts of novels. And I think sort of Broad's argument was that, well, if France knew that I would never destroy them, so he should never have given the task to me because you know, he knew I would never go through with it. And so that's a sign that he was okay with me not burning them. Um, I, I think in the, you know, and, and I think that sort of preservation impulse, which which um, Max Broad obviously had now, you know, he had a lot to gain from that because he made a, rep, you know, he made a reputation and earned a lot of money from being the publisher, essentially, you know, the, the executor, the literary executor, and then the kind of publisher of Kafka's work. Um, but um, in the case of Larkin, you know, his wishes were, carried out to the letter um, not only were the the pages of his journals ripped out and put through the office shredder in the library of the university of hull but the shredded pages were then taken down to the library incinerator and just to be absolutely sure they were kind of burnt to a crisp but what the what we had the opportunity to do and it's one of the acquisitions when i was keeper of special collections i was able to make was to buy the letters that um, Larkin wrote to his, um, you know, the, the, the most important um, woman in his life, Monica Jones, who he was, um, you know, she they were together for, you know, nearly 40 years. And um, he wrote her so often um, that they almost, you can almost kind of reconstruct those diaries and those thoughts. And they're very, very kind of long letters. And it's quite, it was quite interesting. I, I don't think I put this in the book, but um, she, she um, lived in a city called Leicester and at the latter part of her life became ill and went into a hospital and her house was broken into and the letters were actually strewn all over the floor um, when the police discovered that and went into the house and there are still some of them actually have boot prints on on the letters presumably of the people who broke in now they stole her tv but these letters we paid like a quarter of a million pounds for them in the end so they're worth infinitely more than um than than the stuff that the thieves stole but because they're just you know they're just letters aren't they you know why would they be worth anything um, now, in the case of, of Byron, that's really a kind of... Po I don't think Byron cared that his salacious memoirs were published. In fact, he 
um, you know, he really gave them into the hands of one of his friends, knowing that his friend would make some money out of it. But it, it was then his family kind of his family interest, you know, what would his descendants, what would his daughter, what would their lives be like if these um, discoveries were made public? And the other interesting things which which some scholars now feel is that his publisher, John Murray, still a famous publishing house. They publish my book in the UK. Um, what would they think about it? And John Murray was just starting um, his life as a publisher. And the idea that he would go ahead and publish them would place him in uh, in a kind of a place in society that would not be very um would not show him as a gentleman because it would show that he was more interested in money than in the moral guardianship of byron's descendants and his family and so that has been attributed to john murray's actions because the the great event of the burning of byron's memoirs took place in his drawing room in 50 albemarle street if you're lucky enough you might you can go and visit it it's it's still um it's still there the room that all this took place in with jane austen's writing desk and so on are all, all still there so um that 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 sort of reputation management, I think, is at one kind of extreme end of what of what Jeanette Winterson was doing a couple of weeks ago in London with um, burning the, the the unsuitable paperbacks of her of her great works. Yeah, that's it's very interesting, and I love the way you um, talk about the um, aspirations of early publishers to um, be moral stewards as opposed to money grubbers. Um, I'm not sure we would have those distinctions in this country, but that's another story. <laughs> However, um, I I am interested in another kind of um, censorship that's happening today that has happened in the past, and let me just generally talk about it as iconoclasm which is um, a kind of destruction of things which are sacred to other people. So you document at great length, um, again, quite chilling about the zeal with which Reformation England destroyed all of medieval learning. Um, and um, they, they didn't think of the destroying all of medieval learning. Perhaps they thought it was in fact, the work of the devil rather than anyway, it was the work of Catholics. Um, and they were quite, ruthless and pointed about this. And um, the, in fact, um, Oxford and Cambridge have a long history of involvement with that. Um, and the, the, um, the Bodleian Library actually has an intimate relationship with that, um, um, both for um, saving some things and also um, uh, not saving other things. But I, I think um, today there's, um, so there's this growth of new ideological fervor and zeal, shall we say, for correctness of certain views, both on the left and the right. And this is happening, I think, in not just in the United States, although we feel it very keenly here. But now that people are, are encouraged to express um, an, in the most unguarded ways their emotions and thought on social media, there are others who police the social media and tell people when their views are offensive or not. And so they're, they're encouraged to take things down. And in fact, the publishing record, there's a um, woman, a popular novelist here, Ellen Hildebrand, who got complained about a fictional character saying something about Anne Frank and um, her her fans were objecting to her trivializing the Holocaust, which she wasn't. And so she immediately asked her publisher to remove that sentence in her book. So I'm wondering from the, the librarian and archivist and historian in you um, and your fellow professionals, how you feel about it and how you prepared to deal with the fact that things appear online and then they are taken down. Um, and so we'll get into digital archiving in a bit, but I'm just thinking about the ethical um, questions that you face as a someone documenting current times about um, this putting up and taking down and how you deal with that as a custodian of, I, I would call it um, the time of lies and the time of censorship. How do you, how, how are you and your professionals, your fellow professionals dealing with this question of the censor, self-censorship and mob censorship going on now? Um, well, it's, it's, it's a very, difficult issue to deal with as a librarian and an archivist and I think part of the part of the strength of big sort of institutions like mine is that we you know we have kind of a longevity but sometimes that means and particularly big institutions 
we're not we don't move as fast as we can or we should and these things these events particularly in our current world are happening so fast that it's very difficult to and and on a scale and on platforms that operate globally and in in a massive scale that it's it's very very kind of hard to keep pace with and um, I think that sort of sense of documenting those changes, I mean, you know, those decisions, those pressures, those responses are really very, very important to document. So the fact that somebody said something, that other people objected, that that prompted a result, a, a response is worthy of documentation because it tells us so much about the world in which we live today at the context in which many decisions in public and in private life are being made and that we need to understand this in the future if we're to understand what happened in uh, you know um, June 2021 what, what 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 the world was like um, but the ability to move fast enough and on a scale that is um relevant to the way that communication happens in public life today is a very very big challenge and perhaps we'll come on to talk about that um, more so uh, I think there are uh, I'm very conscious and I write and pay tribute to in my book a bit about what I call activist archivists so people who are perhaps not in institutions like the Bodleian Library but are making moves to preserve information to preserve knowledge to preserve some of these um, events um, in real time today and it you know as you can see over time just like in the reformation of the 16th century when there were whole-scale destruction of Catholic, the contents of catholic religious libraries um, there were individuals who took action themselves the antiquaries of the 16th century and they were brief custodians from one institutional context to another so they are the bridges between the destroyed libraries of the reformation of the middle of the 16th century and the new institutions like the Bodleian Library like what became uh, the British Library like um, Lambeth Palace Library um, that today holds so much of the remnants of those great medieval collections. It was because of those activists that we were able to make that bridge and to preserve the knowledge that we have today, just a tiny fraction of the contents of those medieval libraries. But that impulse for preservation and the impulse to create the institutions like the Bodleian um, by Sir Thomas Bodley were responses to those acts of destruction. And um, I'm not probably not doing a very good job at answering your very interesting. No, no, um, no, no. It's it's I but, mean, um, it's it's quite a good answer. I mean, I for me, it's um, I just want to point out the ethical questions involved since you have thought about this and it's part of your your day job, as you put it. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, but the other thing is that um, I think especially through reading in this spending time in this book, you, you highlight very well for me what I, mean, I know having worked in a library, um, it's, it feels like, which is this illusion we have in the present that things are moving so fast that we have to have these, you know, these activists, archivists, and that librarians are totally unable to act quickly in the time. And one thing that your book is full of is individuals and groups of people who have in fact acted very much in moments of crisis. They've run into burning buildings, for example, they've run under sniper fire, they've done all sorts of things to preserve information when they know that they themselves are doomed or the larger part of that legacy is doomed. That what we have from the Middle Ages, and we have quite a bit, was the actions that people took in moments of crises when everything felt like it was urgent and people could either act now or that knowledge was lost forever and ever and ever. Yeah. So the, I just want to point out that the illusion we have that we're in this different time frame now when everything is urgent and nothing's ever been urgent in library land before is just that. It's an <laughs> that's a very urgent. good, that's a very good um, corrective, um, Abby. I think, thank you for point, making that point, um, which I should have made, but you, 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 you're absolutely right. And I, I think the other, the other thing to say is that sometimes, um, and, um, you know, Laura Miller has made this point to me recently, um, that librarians and archivists 
have often broken the rules. You know, we have created systems uh, and, you know, our own rules for what it is to, to do our jobs as librarians and archivists. But very often, some of the most important things that we have today, some of the most important collections that have survived have been because people broke the rules, mm -hmm. their, their own rules, their own professional rules to do that. And I think that's um, part of, you know, the point that you were just making there, I think. Yeah, I, I was always struck at the Library of Congress that although you know, like the profession is, tends to be um, attract conservative people. Their job actually is to conserve things. Um, they always seem to be one step ahead or several steps ahead of what's going to be important um, in a way that historians actually are usually four or five steps behind. Um, so that <laughs> so that librarians had this incredible, I would, I don't know, it almost felt like an instinct for the things that will have long-term value when most people don't. Um, but I want to talk about another, if I could just um, raise another issue that has um, multiple ethical dimensions, um, and there are no right or wrong answers, or there are several right or wrong answers. And that is, and something which you um, at the at the Bodleian have intimate um, firsthand knowledge of, and that is dealing with the, the legacy of colonialism in libraries. Um, and the fact that many of the, um, the, the sources of knowledge um, in colonies and in, in indigenous communities that have been conquered by Western or other powers, I mean, Chinese as well, or uh, Japanese, um, end up being expropriated from their original site and taken into places uh, where in the West where they're conserved. And now the discussion is about repatriating those, sometimes back to countries where this materials may not survive for very long because it's still a war-torn region. So I'm wondering if you could give us some, so you talk about about this in your book quite eloquently, but if you could give some personal perspective on some of the some of the tough decisions that you face at the Bodley and, and mm. that we in general, the librarian profession, face in looking at these issues which are so urgent today. Yeah. So I think um, our colleagues in the museum sector are quite um, some way ahead of us in all of this. Um, and the, the nature of the museum debates, you know, for example, over the Benin bronzes um, are slightly different to many of the cases in libraries. We have one which is kind of in that territory, which I would describe as um, uh, kind of treasure. Um, and that's from um, an incident that took place in Ethiopia in, in 1868, known as the Magdala Raid, where um, essentially the royal treasury of Ethiopia was um, looted by British troops, British troops on a rampage, um, and who took, ended up bringing back to the UK you know, extraordinary treasures from this kind of ancient community and of, you know, sacred royal treasures of great symbolic and, well, monetary, artistic, cultural, but also symbolic value. And those included, uh, and, and there are many of these things, these objects in some of the great museums, in, particularly in London, the Victorian Albert, the British Museum in particular, but there were also manuscripts. And some of those manuscripts, uh, and again, um, they were distributed over a number of repositories in the UK. Um, we have a few of them in the Bodleian, but we also have many other Ethiopic treasures which have been acquired through legitimate reams um, and in more recent times. Um, than, than the Magdala manuscripts that we have. Um, one of the interesting things that we did um, a couple of years ago was to try to, um, uh, and uh, because you know these things have been available for scholars in you know with with catalogues, printed catalogues, very erudite um, uh, things indeed. But we we we've been trying to make the presence of these objects more available to the communities of diaspora of from Ethiopia and Eritrea. So we reached out um, to the communities in, in the, there's a large community, you know, sizable community in London, for example, and invited members of churches and of the local communities to come and, and just have a look at this stuff and, uh, and then to curate an exhibition for us. And, um, and we were very, very open about the sources of 
where the material had come from and we left it up to them to decide what they would put on show and in particular what they would write in the captions of the of the exhibition and the community over a series of these workshops just were, were just amazed that they could get you know up close to this material but also where um they had an access to their culture. So the colors, the style of decoration, even the way the book bindings were made were very particular to their, um, their own community. And I, they, they had such a kind of literally a visceral experience of, of working with these documents that the exhibition, although there were materials from the Magdala Raid in the exhibition, they chose not to actually highlight, highlight that in the, in the captions. The Ethiopian ambassador came to open the exhibition and um, what they wanted to do was to actually celebrate their culture and to celebrate the, its, its beauty, its achievement, its richness. And um, that element of um, th the show was what those people wanted to emphasize. Now, um, you know, I, I'm, I have no doubt that I, at some point there will be a formal request from uh, a government to come repatriate material um and we now have i didn't actually at the time that the, my was writing the book the university didn't actually have a framework for dealing with these issues we now do and we will be able to um you know all of these things have to be taken on a case by case basis but the principle is there that if there is a strong moral and uh, case for the return of materials that we have in the bodleian that we will we are prepared to take that step. And in the meantime, there are other documentation that we have, which for example, is the, the records of British colonial administrators, their own diaries and photographs, for example, when they were working in, um, let's say Ghana, um, that we are working with the government of Ghana to, to digitize these materials um, so that they can have that access to that perspective on their own history and I think it's it's a, a particularly contested with the case of national archives with the with um, migrated or displaced collections where governments um, uh, or, or where, where, where colonial governments are on the point of independence and they have these decisions whether to leave those records of their own colonial administrations in the newly independent country because they document that country's history or whether it comes back to the so-called um you know parent government or home government of the colonial era because they're really just in our archival terms they're just actually departmental records and they belong with the, the the other records of the colonial administration so that's arguments that have been used and um it's been very interesting more recently where um our own foreign and colonial office um had uh, in fact, a huge archive, a massive archive, which they kept secret and was only revealed to exist in 2011 um, when um, the Kenyan government took the UK government to court um, to uh, expose its existence. And indeed, those records, the, col the, the colonial records of Kenya, have now been transferred to the National Archives. Um, where they've become accessible. In fact, they're, they're being digitised and there's great collaboration going on between the UK National Archives and the Kenyan National Archives. But I think these are, these are absolutely critical issues of our time. And they're, um, you know, the, those histories are, are, are complex and often very, very difficult. And, um, uh, and, you know, I think only through collaboration can those institutions make these uh, cultural decisions work. So, you know, sometimes it's actually easier for institution to institution to work together and collaborate than it is for governments to do that because there's there's so much kind of politics in the way. But there's also, you know, in this day and age, we have the benefit of digitization, which means particularly for um 
you know, archival documents from, let's say, the last hundred years, where they're often in large scale and they're actually quite suitable for digitization. And there's, you know, um, I think uh, there is a moral obligation from the former colonial powers to, um, to, you know, basically spend the money and do the digitization and to make sure the digitized versions are preserved and made available and are, are uh, you know, it, it ensure their long time access to those. Um, so that that's my that's my take on those on those issues. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, sometimes um, talk about wanting to protect um, somebody's reputation. You know, those archives, particularly the ones in Kenya, are not very flattering to the Brits. Um, we no. understand that. Um, we have similar problems. So I have many more questions. However, so do many people in the audience. So I want to turn in a minute to their questions, which are very provocative. But let me ask one more thing. Well, first, let me say that um, I highly recommend that people look at chapter the chapter called Digital Deluge, in which you propose a memory tax on institutions, on corporations that make a lot of money from the internet to fund the kind of preservation activities that are necessary to preserve the internet. Um, but on that, um, uh, on that note, I wanna ask if you could just say briefly, you talk about, you perceive a need on the part of in traditional inst or institutions such as the Bodleian and other research libraries to work hand in glove with the Internet Archive to support the kind of work that you both need to do about, about preserving the web. And I'm wondering if there, you could give us like three points of, of, of three, three actions that you think that the Bodleian and other libraries could take in collaboration with the archive to further the work of saving the web. Um, you talk about collaboration, but not, with, not very specifically. Okay, um, three things. Uh, okay, so let me think. Um, well, the first is to use the Archive It service. So um, to, you know, actively collaborate, um, and that's, you know, um, spending money on doing it, but then actually spending the institutional time of uh, colleagues to identify resources that should be archived on the web at a more granular level. Um, and also, I think to, um, you know, to engage in other kinds of web archiving activities. I mean, we're part in the in the Bodleian, we're part of the UK um, Consortium of Legal Deposit Libraries, um, both in the UK and in the Republic of Ireland, where we work together. This is kind of independently of the Internet Archive, but in parallel. And I think this is kind of supporting what the Internet Archive does. Um, which is to archive the whole of the UK web domain, and um, the uh, so uh, the, the 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 legislation in the UK was changed in 2013 to make it um, legally permissible for um, the whole of the UK web to be captured by the legal deposit libraries, and that we've been doing that since 2013. I actually chair the implementation group that oversees that activity, um, and. Um, so, you know, very much in the concept of lots of copies keep stuff safe, I, I think, you know, there is no one uh, source of this activity that um, you should, we should rely on. We need to have multiple archives of the web working in, in concert with each other. And of course, there are fantastic services which glue these things together, like Memento, for example. And um, I think the other thing that, that, we can do together so that there, there are two things um so use the archive it service do your own web archiving um in parallel to uh what the internet archive is doing and then uh, i think there's um let me think a third thing um i i think sort of um there's there's something about the shared expertise and knowledge that um, in particular web archiving or digital preservation, um, we, we need to do more to spread the, um, the approaches, the policies, the capabilities, the technologies, the techniques, the skills, 
Um, and uh, I, I, I'm speaking as president of the Digital Preservation Coalition, which is mostly UK institutions. It's becoming more international. And um, I, I think I'd just encourage that kind of sense of collaboration um, in this space, because no one institution can do it alone. We all have to be not only doing our own bit placing our own pieces of the jigsaw in the picture but we also need to be um, working together and there are various levels in which we can work together and I think just you know sharing knowledge sharing expertise encouraging each other and supporting each other to do this kind of vital work is is what I would encourage people to do. Great thank you very much that was for with it, Richard, when I asked you for three things, um, three very, very powerful things. So I want to turn to uh, questions from our um, audience. Um, and there's one that especially interests me. Um, first, it's uh, the question is, I'm a newly employed librarian, just graduated from library school in spring, now working in my library's special collections department. What can I do to help preserve information locally in my own library? Um, well, that's a very good question. I mean, just show as much enthusiasm as you can for the task of um, that your department is doing. So get involved in as many aspects of its work as you possibly can. Um, show as much enthusiasm as you can. And I think look at what the collections that they have are. Look at what collection development policies that it may have. And if you can identify uh, um, an at-risk collection out in the community, or if you can, um, if you know of a, um, you know, um, a, a donor who's looking for an institution to um, place a collection in, uh, bring it to the attention of um, your colleagues. And um, I think there's, you know, special collections in my experience i've worked in them all you know i'm very delighted to say virtually all my career um have have that sort of impulse for for preserving but i i hope that they'll take um they'll take delight in your initiative and your enthusiasm for it and i think the other thing perhaps the other thing to say is um that special collections need to be as rooted in the present um as it, much as in you know the, the the distant past so look at perhaps look to see what is being created today whether that's in digital form or in um or, or in more traditional form and collect it yourself form a collection and then give it to your institution when you move on to your next job and um and then there'll be a fond with your name on it or um uh you know you'll be in the provenance record of um uh, or, or, of a collection and that's sometimes how some of our greatest collections in libraries have actually been formed by other librarians and archivists as collectors yes collecting with other people's money as we used to say um <laughs> are there alternatives to libraries selling off or deaccessioning large parts of their collection oh i hope so um we uh, we don't in the Bodleian, uh, deaccession or sell collections. Uh, as a rule, we don't do it. Um, you know, there are certain categories of material that we do deaccession. Multiple copies of the same textbook, uh, for example, in print, where we, you know, it goes out of print, and we don't need to keep thirty-five copies of it, but we can keep one or perhaps two. Um, uh, and I'm I I you always regret the things you sell. Um, you know, one of our great treasures. I, I showed Bruce to that manuscript of Euclid's Elements from the ninth century. Well, um, at the time I was doing an exhibition for um, a group of mathematicians. That's the reason why it was out. And um, I thought oh, I'll look up to see if we have a copy of the first printed text of Euclid, which was printed in. Uh, Basel in 1533 by a great scholar printer and uh, I, I we had more than one copy I, I called them up from the stack and the first one I opened um, had a presentation inscription from the editor um, a famous renaissance scholar called um, Simon Grineus to Thomas More um, you know the Henry VIII's chancellor 
um, the author of Utopia. Um, and so it's a presentation copy to him. And he gave it, Thomas More gave it to the tutors, to his children. And they, um, it then passed to uh, the Library of College in Cambridge, who sold it as a duplicate. And, um, <laughs> and I'm sure they sold it because they thought, oh, someone scribbled on the title page and has ruined it. Because that was, you know, in the 19th century, that was the kind of fashion is that you didn't have, you didn't really like things that had been written in, even if it was been written in by, you know, interesting people um you try to kind of bleach them out you know literally wiping the pages with bleach to kind of get rid of those inscriptions and we've lost so much knowledge that way anyway the point is that uh, I, I i'm not a great believer in deaccessioning selling things off unless unless one is abs unless an institution is absolutely desperate Yes, but it does sound like you're in favour of buying things from organisations which are deaccessioning. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, this, was bought, this was bought by a scholar who then presented it as a gift. Oh, OK. But um, yeah, no, I have done it in the past. I have bought um, things from from deaccession sales. Yeah. So we have um, there's one question that you may not um, be able to answer, Richard, but it's it's um, interesting uh, to think about. And maybe, you know, colleagues who can answer this question. What is the present status of the library's records and collective memories of the Uyghur people and Tibetans under Chinese rule? Is this something that um, the library community feels is a, a, a real present danger? Um, yes, uh, in short, uh, it does. And certainly there are there is a network of li libraries that work with Tibetan collections. We are part of that network. Um, so we have a fairly well documented collection. We continue to acquire material. I think the Uyghurs are um, less well. Uh, I, I think that sort of community of preservation around the Uyghurs is less well developed. Um, I'm not so familiar with it myself. I know that we have very little um, material, um, and that's partly because um, uh, it, it was relatively late in which the kind of scholarly interest in that part of Central Asia became um you know, um, adopted in the West, if I can put it like that. It was a relatively, in Western terms, a relatively less well um, uh, arranged uh, set of languages and of cultures and histories. I think we are all now bitterly regretting that, um, that sort of centuries of neglect. And interestingly enough, I think the resurrection of those languages for serious study was actually... Um, improved under Soviet communism because the um, the Soviet as as those many of those states became Soviet um, after 1917 uh, they established um, universities um, or branches of say the University of Moscow in places like um, you know Azerbaijan and 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 uh, Uzbekistan and also the Soviet academies um, became began to publish the uh, works in those um, indigenous languages and it's really the many of the western collections have relied on access to those soviet publications of the 20th century for their collections on that region um, and so i think it is a big gap i think um you know, because of the way that the Chinese internet is controlled, there's there's much less material, contemporary material that we can we we can even do things like web archiving, archiving on or social media archiving. So it's very kind of fragmentary, and and I, I I'm sure that the library community should be doing more. And there may well be things which I'm not aware of that that's going on. Um, you know, the, the discussion about um, the, the West neglect or um, certain indigenous communities not featuring so high on our radar. Um, I think we can um, tie this into the, another question which has to do with indigenous um, collections. And that is, can you talk about the cultural sensitivities required to display artifacts and archival materials from indigenous peoples? Um, and if I can append something to that, um, is there a way that, in fact, librarians and archivists should be thinking more proactively about reaching out to those indigenous communities 
that we have neglected, not just to think about how to display the materials, but so you, you're saying in the case of the Uyghurs, if we had simply paid more attention, we might be in a better position to know what's happening with them. Um, I, I think I think there are several ways I'd like to uh, answer that question. So the first is on a, on a kind of practical level. I think there are projects now. The Mellon Foundation has been very good at supporting a number of them, um, which are where well-established libraries are working with communities to support their archiving activities within their own communities. So it's 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 a supportive role rather than a, a sort of let's come in and take all your stuff from you role. I think those days are gone. It's got to be a much more collaborative and supportive activity where the research library or the university library or the national library um, becomes um, more of much more of a partner and collaborator than a, um, a, a an inter, an intervener and a, and a taker. Um, I think the other thing to say is that um, some of the collections that are in institutions which are the reason why communities are able to come in, like the Ethiopian community, coming um, into, you know, take great pleasure in accessing and understanding their own cultural collections or in the Bodleian, um, is that in the past, those institutions were able to almost take risks in the material that they acquired. So, we are our budgets are under so much pressure um we're under such managerial constraint that we tend to move much more to just in case um sorry just in time rather than just in case collecting and i think that um the danger there is that that we become much less um we, we take fewer risks we um we acquire m much more narrowly um, to sort of contemporary needs rather than thinking ahead into the future. And um, I think that's a big danger. Um, I, and, you know, one of the, the cases I like to cite is, is my, my institution. You know, I go back to the well of history of the Bodley and many, you know, constantly for inspiration. Well, um, you know, back we were we opened our doors in 1602. In 1604, we had an agent in Amsterdam um, purchasing books that came off a Dutch East India Company cargo ship, merchant ship from China. And that agent purchased books that were part of the stock of the ship, and they were brought back to Oxford they were Chinese books. They were books in the Chinese language. Um, it was another 80 years before there was anyone on the staff of the Bodleian who could read them. And we actually employed the first Chinese librarian to be employed outside of China, a man called Shen Fuxiong, um, who the first thing he did was turn them up the right way or on the shelves. And he worked with my predecessor, Thomas Hyde, the fifth librarian, to catalogue them. He actually taught uh, the rudiments of Mandarin to, my, to, to Hyde. And, um, you know, he celebrated today in Oxford, not just in the library, um, but as um, uh, and it's that kind of sense of um, actually needing members of that community to work with you in order to um, be able to do the kind of archival processing or the library tasks necessary to be part, to have um to be part of that, somebody who's part of that community to do it. And, you know, I'm pleased to say that we paid Shen Fuzhong. We have the records of his payments. Um, he was paid seriously to do, to do the work that he did. So here's another question, Richard, which uh, may not be relevant for the Bodleian, but um, is certainly relevant for people at the Internet Archive, and perhaps we can think more broadly about this. Are there examples where archives have endangered people? I'm thinking about photos from protests being run through facial recognition software to identify people at peaceful protests last summer in the US. But in general, have there been times when the records that we've kept actually been used against the people about whom we keep records? And what do you do about that? 
Um, well, uh, this is this is undoubtedly true. Uh, I'm just trying to think of a case in, if you like, a Western library or archive where um, uh, unpleasant things like that have happened. I'm, I, but certainly, you know, uh, you know, a classic one is the, you know, the the um, the, the Stasi archives in East Germany. Um, you know, these were created. These were you know, extensive documentary archives that were created um, as part and parcel of the state surveillance and oppression of, of an entire people. And those records, um, it's very interesting that those, you know, at the point of um, uh, the collapse of the Soviet regime, the com communism in East Germany, um, there were, um, there was a kind of mass, and of course this is um, of, pre um pre pre social media days a mass walk in to many stasi headquarters across uh east germany to prevent the stasi from destroying those records so um that's probably not the right answer to the question that was posed but i'm just trying to um i'm trying to think of um or, or, or of an instance where there has been um uh, kind of, you know, enforced access to, to records that may have endangered people. Of course, you know, we have a duty of care in the UK in terms of the, um, the Data Protection Act here to uh, prevent harm coming to living individuals who may be mentioned in archives without their permission. So there's a kind of, you know, a whole layer of ethical responsibility that an archival institution has with contemporary records where, um, we have a duty of care for living individuals who are mentioned in them. Yeah, and I would say it's uh, there's we have in the United States FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, where um, you can force someone in through a court action for some information to be revealed. And there have been many instances where in the pursuit of truth, a journalist has unearthed something which has hurt a number of people. But nothing, um, that's not exactly um, the face recognition case, which this person is mentioning. Um, so let me, um, there's a, there are questions like, you know, should you keep pornography, religious fundamentalism, is, is the other things like that that are worth preserving? And does it bother you to see political impetus for in-truth and propaganda at work today? How can we ensure materials that do survive are appropriate for learning history and projecting consequences? I think altogether we can say, so So, is there any, um, we will not collect this, it's too distasteful uh, rule that you have in the library and archival world. Um, and then how do you, um, and we touched on this before, how do you ensure that lies which are lies are still kept as lies in a culture that tells lies? Yeah. So um, this is why you need trained librarians and archivists. <laughs> Um, because it's all about the archival process to document and uh, understand the provenance of information and being able to maintain those trails of um, understanding of context and provenance and history and indeed use is all part of the ability to distinguish um, truth from falsehood and there are a whole you know there, there are other um, uh, techniques and skills that are often necessary um, you know we still occasionally discover medieval charters that have been forged and they were forged in the 13th century um, and we know that because there are skills like paleography and code ecology well today we have digital forensics and those skills which are now part of the librarians and the archivists skills have to be part of their skill set um, help us to distinguish um, where records are authentic or not and we need to keep the falsehoods and we need to keep the truth so that we can understand the difference between them but they're all expressions of the times in which we live and they have to be preserved and kept um, and also so that those records can be used as evidence and I think again there's a, a growing sense that we need to think less of them as records and more of these documents as evidence they're evidence of our past, but they can also be evidence of our present um, in the case of things which have a kind of legal and evidential value. Yeah, and just to, to wind up, you know, that's the evidence that was um, the target of destruction in Sarajevo. 
the evidence that you know people help land and yep. so on and so forth. Absolutely. So let me ask you one final question, uh, and that is, uh, what else are you writing about? Is there another book in the works? <laughs> well, um, I've been writing recently about self deleting and encrypted messages being used by government and uh, government officials. Um, so I published an article in the financial, an op-ed in the Financial Times last October. I just published recently in the Times newspaper, their kind of political column, which is called Red Box. And um, there's a piece on the, uh, the London Review of Books blog, um, again, f just of a couple of weeks ago, which is about kind of political records and the, the way in which the technology for messaging using encrypted and self-deleting messaging services like Signal or Telegram or indeed, you know, certain functions on WhatsApp and so on are being increasingly used by government ministers wherever not just in the uk but all over the all over the world and um civil servants and special advisors to formulate government policy now in the uk to my mind these fall under the 1958 public records act and they there is a duty that any paid official should be preserving these things and they should be um be be treated as public records, both in terms of the Freedom of Information Act, our equivalent of your FOIA, or for long-term historical value, because this is how current policies to do with COVID, to do with um, all sorts of kind of, you know, important Brexit, all sorts of important contemporary uh, affairs are treated. And um, there was an extraordinary moment in the Brexit debates back in 20. Um, uh, 19 as I was finishing the book off where um, one of the uh, conservative rebels a man called Dominic, Dominic Grieve had been the attorney general actually in, in the house of commons um, uh, tabled a motion called uh, um, uh, what was it the, um, the uh, an, an ordinance, a very kind of obscure parliamentary procedure where he listed an extraordinary, it's like a kind of catalogue of modern technology um, for all the different formats, WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram, Snapchat, uh, you know, SMS, message, you know, the whole list of it. it. And it's there in Hansard. It's an absolutely incredible moment and forcing government um, special advisors and ministers to disclose, to table before the House of Commons all the messages on Brexit that they had exchanged using these technologies. Um, and so I think this is becoming an absolutely critical moment for open society, for the way that democratic governments work, and um, not just for our current moment, so that you know people right now can understand what on earth our our governments are proposing to do but so that we have the right historical record of it and I sort of I just finished reading Robert Caro's book Working I don't know if you've read that it's the most extraordinary inspiring set of essays about the historian's craft and he he records he recalls going up to the Linda B Johnson archives for the first time in in Austin Texas and climbing the stairs and seeing this kind of glass wall with all the boxes of the archive ahead of him and and he thinks I've made a big mistake here. And he remembers, um, uh, and it's kind of, the archivist tells him that there are 14 million documents in the archive. And he said, I remembered the advice I was given when I started out my career, turn every page. Um, and so, um, and that's really what I, I think we should be giving our successors the opportunity to turn every page. And that means capturing those digital messages between uh, government ministers, even if they're in these, these, you know, we've got to find a way of doing it, whether through regulation or through technology um, to, to try and, you know, save that information for the future. Um, and then the book, the next book, um, I want it actually to be about librarians and archivists, about the people, the mortals in the portal. Richard, thank you very much. It's very inspiring. I want to, before I turn it back to Krista, walk us out. 
and urge you to buy the book at the Booksmith, my local bookstore, I want to just quote something back at you, which I will always keep in my mind. You say, the preservation of knowledge is ultimately, as Max Brod knew, about having faith in the future. I think that's the, that's to me the essence of what preservation is about and about librarianship and archivists. It's a faith in the future. Thank you so much for your time, Richard, and for your wonderful book. Thank you, Abby. I so enjoyed talking to you and can't wait to do so in person again soon. Yes, me too. It'll be a big treat. Chris, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Brewster and, and colleagues. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, turn every page. I think I'm going to take that that to heart as we uh, uh, into tomorrow and the rest of my library career. Uh, so um, as we wrap here, I want to share some final information. As I mentioned at the top, we, we have recorded this session. We will be sending an email tomorrow to everyone who registered with a link to that recording. Now, we're also going to share that recording on social media. And so if you would like, uh, please share the messages. Uh, we're at Internet Archive across social media. Um, it'd be great if you could share those messages with your colleagues and your friends uh, across your social network. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Abby and Richard both for their uh, thoughtful conversation and time today. And as Abby mentioned, if you haven't picked up your copy of Burning the Books, uh, please do consider buying one from uh, the Booksmith, the local San Francisco uh, bookstore, or uh, from your own, uh, the local bookstore that's in your community. Um, I uh, I'm, would like to see if Brewster has any final thoughts, anything, Brewster, that you'd like to, to say in closing today? Just thank you, thank you, uh, Abby and, and Richard, for the work that you've done, and also um, being so welcoming of new libraries and new librarians uh, into the fold. Um, that's so important, I think, for the reinvigoration. But it's um, but you personify it uh, in in your own actions. So uh, as as the digital librarian near the Internet Archive, thank you. And a final thank you to you, uh, our audience, for your time and your interest today and your excellent questions. All right, everyone, have a great day.